Hello. In this video, we'll continue our corporate tax discussion and we'll focus on corporate stock distributions checklists. So the first question when you're looking at this checklist or these checklists is to determine what kind of distribution does the corporation have because that's going to be a function or that's going to influence which checklist you're, you're using in your analysis. So the first question, does the corporation distribute property or stock in the corporation? So section 317 defines property for purposes of property distributions um, as money, securities, and other property except that stock in the corporation making the distribution does not constitute property. So the idea is that if you have a property distribution, which property does not include stock in the corporation making the distribution, you're going to use the corporate distributions checklist. And that's what this point right here says. So you're going to go to the section 301 corporate distributions checklist. However, if you have a stock distribution, stock in the corporation making the distribution, you're going to use these checklists, the stock corporate stock distributions checklist, which follow. Now note that stock rights or rights to acquire stock like stock options are treated as stock for purposes of the of um, the stock distribution checklist. So if you have a stock option or right to acquire stock in the future, you're going to use the corporate stock distribution checklist, not the property. So again, if the distribution is stock of the corporation or in the corporation, we use the stock distributions checklist that proceed. We're going to have two checklists, okay? One that focuses on the shareholder and one that focuses on the corporation. So this is going to be the section 305 through section 307 checklist, or I should say 305 and 307 checklists. All right. So we're first going to start with the assumption that we have a corporate stock distribution. Again, if we had a property distribution and from the corporation, we would go look at the corporate, um, the corporate property or corporate distribution checklist that we have that I've made videos on. Go see those videos on section 301 and dealing with those issues, the four step process. But we have a stock distribution. So the first issue we're going to deal with, with respect to the um, stock distributions, we're going to look at the checklist that focuses on the shareholder, the shareholder. Now, I have an example to better understand this checklist, okay? And this example does not have an analysis because you'll see that the questions are not yet there. So let's go ahead and read this example. Fruit Tree Corporation has 100 shares of common stock outstanding, and there's only one class of stock in the corporation, this common stock outstanding. And just so you know, because there's only one class of stock, this common stock has to have voting rights by its nature. And the 100 shares are owned equally by five shareholders, apple, banana, coconut, dragon fruit, and eggplant. Or you could just do A, B, C, D, E to make it simple. Whenever you're analyzing an exam question or even in practice, you know, it, it helps when you're doing analysis internally, you can just simplify the parties, right? A, B, C, D, E, make it simple so you don't have to write it out every time. So each shareholder, since they own equally the 100 shares, and they're all the same class of stock, all voting common stock, they each own 20 shares, 20 shares, which which equals out to 20% ownership, right? 20 shares over 100 shares, 20% ownership in the corporation. Now, the value of each share is $1,000 per share. So that means the corporation is roughly um, about, or is valued at this time, let's say it's because it's closely held, a million dollars, right? 100 shares times 1,000, my apologies, $100,000, right? Where did I get a million? It's worth um, $100,000 the value of the corporation, okay? Math was never my strong suit. Um, 100 shares times $1,000, $100,000. So we're focusing specifically here, even though we have five shareholders and we're doing the consequences for the shareholders, we're looking at Apple to give us some context. So Apple has an adjusted basis per share and her 20 shares of $300 per share. So that's a total, that's a total adjusted basis. If we took the 20 shares times $300, that's $6,000 that Apple has in her 20 shares. Fruit Tree Corp then declares and pays a 10% stock distribution, a stock 10% stock distribution. That's another thing I want to mention is that um, and it's, it's in the, earlier in the checklist and I didn't focus on it, but 
Um, anytime you see a stock distribution, you can also use the term or phrase stock dividend as well. They're pretty much synonymous. They're, they mean the same thing in the tax world. We have to analyze it under the stock distribution rules. So stock distribution, stock dividend. I like to use the phrase stock distribution to make it clear for students. We're using the stock distribution checklist. But if you have an exam or in practice, you hear stock dividend, That's you're thinking of the same things. So fruit tree declares and pays a 10% stock distribution. So each shareholder gets an additional two shares, right? Because each shareholder owns 20 shares of stock times 0.10 or 10% is two shares. Now, after the distribution, the corporation is 110 shares outstanding. How do we get that? There's 100 shares outstanding before times 0.10 or 10%. That gives us um, 10 additional shares. 10 additional shares. If we add that to the um, to the 100 shares that were before, we have 100 plus the 10 new shares, that's 110. Each shareholder now owns 22 shares, and 22 divided by 110, 110 total, that still equals 20%, 20% ownership. So before the ownership was 20%, after the ownership is 20%. Notice there's no change in ownership, okay? Although the total number of shares has increased, the shareholder's percentage ownership interest stays the same. It remains 20%. Okay, so again, this was just to give you an example of the kind of issues we're dealing with stock distributions. There's no analysis here, nothing. At this time, I want to actually take a look back at one of the problems that we've already done, or I'm sorry, one of the problems I've done in the past for you, and I want to bring attention to that so that you can focus, you can go back and look at that video if you haven't yet looked at that video, and also to look at some issues from that video to help us in this analysis. All right, so the video I'm talking about is Gross Income Problem 3, where Lemon and Lime organized a corporation, each contributing $50,000 and each receiving 500 shares of common stock, having a par value of $100 per share. At the end of the first year, the corporation had accumulated net earnings of $100,000. We saw a cash dividend where we went through the gross income because we were looking at the consequences of both lemon and lime, and we saw if a cash dividend, right, under the Glenshaw glass, three-part analysis, net worth, realization, dominion control, the three elements you need for to have gross income, right, we had all three of those things. The net worth, assets went up. Realization, right, there's now the cash, which is severed from the original shares of stock as a distribution, and then we have dominion control because lemon and lime can do as they see fit. But then we changed up the facts, and this is where I want to focus. I want to focus our time and energy on this one. We have a cor the corporation. These are two separate uh, fact patterns. Corporation declares a one-for-one -one stock dividend, which each shareholder gets 500 shares. So if we go through the three-part analysis of Glenshaw Glass, the net worth, realization, main control, domain control and realization are both met. So again, if you haven't yet reviewed that video, please look over that video. I go through the full analysis. Dominion control because the new shares of stock, the new 500 shares that both Lemon and Lime receive, they can do as they see fit. The realization, because it's severed, you can separate out the original 500 shares from the new 500 shares. Net worth, though, was the issue. And this is why we did not have gross income. The reason is because when you look at a um, stockholder's equity or owner's equity section of the balance sheet, or the owner's, I'm sorry, the owner's, ne um, owner's equity, because Lemon and Lime assets equal liabilities, plus owner's equity, so net worth is that owner's equity portion. All, a, all that's go going on here is this corporation had a value before the distribution, the stock distribution or dividend of $100,000, right? $50,000 both contributed. Um, actually, I'm sorry, it had a value of uh, $200,000. My apologies. The $100,000 that they both contributed and then the accumulated net earnings of $100,000. So paid in capital side of stockholders equity, the company would have a hundred thousand. That's the investments that they both contributed. And then the corporation at the end of the first year accumulate a hundred thousand dollars of net earnings through net income. So that's under the retained earnings section of the stockholders equity. So assets equals liabilities plus owner's equity. The owner's equity portion would be, um, which is the net worth of the company would be $200,000. So when this stock distribution takes place, What's happening is the corporation is moving money from one side of stockholders' equity, specifically retained earnings, to the paid-in capital, 
So it's moving the $100,000 of accumulated net earnings and retained earnings, it's moving that to stockholders' equity. Okay, it's moving that to stockholders' equity, part of that, through the shares of stock. So more um, paid in capital section of stockholders' equity goes up and retained earnings would go down. But in total, the retained, I'm sorry, the stockholders' equity still stays equal to $200,000. So there's no change in the value of the uh, entity. It still it was $200,000, the value before the distribution, after the distribution, still $200,000. So keep that in mind. When it comes to the shareholders, which is what we're focusing on here, Lemon and Lime both before owned 500 shares, and then after now they own 1,000 shares. They, own, they have 500 uh, more shares. They get 500 more shares. They own uh, common stock before, common stock after 500 shares, so they've gone up to now 1,000 shares. Well, before the stock distribution, there was 1,000 shares outstanding, right? 500 to Lemon, 500 to Lime. Now there's 2,000 shares outstanding, 1,000 to Lemon, 1,000 to Lime. So before, each of them owned 50%, 500 over 1,000. After, now each of them own um, 100 over, two, I'm sorry, 100, 1,000 1, over 2,000. So they still own before and after 50%. And I showed that in this calculation. Therefore, the value, okay, is still going to be the same before and after. Okay, it's still going to be the same before and after, just so you know. I think in this problem, I showed a 50,000. I was just referring to the before and after percentages staying the same, right? Um, yes, we've moved, um, but they still own the same amount of the corporation, the net worth. I, I was just focusing on that $50,000 in the, um, the amount of the stock and the value there, just so you know if I refer to that in the problem. Okay, so in the problem, if I use uh, 100,000 value, I was 2,000, same idea. The idea is that before and after, they still own the same ownership, 50%, and the corporation hasn't changed in value. Therefore, their net worth has not gone up. Therefore, we do not have a gain or loss that Lemon and Lime has to, um, either of them have to record in this transaction. So cash dividend, yes, but stock dividend here because it's a pro rata stock distribution on common stock, no. So let's go back to our checklist and use this idea and let's go through and look at our example and then look at the um, situations where you could have potentially gross income from a stock distribution and I'll explain why and what differs from this situation where it's a pro rata stock distribution on common stock. All right, so in our example, we have a very similar situation, just a lot more shareholders and less shares. Again, each of them own the same ownership before and after. That's the key. And it's on common shares, so they keep their same common ownership, which is important here. And the cor corporation still is worth the same afterwards. So what you're going to see is that any time that a common shareholder receives a stock distribution where ownership stays the same, their ownership stays the same, and the corporation's value does not change, well, that's going to be um, no um, gain or loss or no income that has to be recorded, and that's going to be specifically under Section 305. Now, in the video for what the problem I just showed you, I focused on the Glenshaw Glass, and I mentioned Eisner versus McCumber. Eisner versus McCumber was even before Glenshaw Glass and dealt specifically with stock distributions, and the court reasoned and said, hey, there's no um, stock, there's no uh, uh, income recorded, no gross income for the shareholders because nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. The net worth hasn't gone up. There's no gain here. They, yes, the number of shares has changed. There's more shares now, but the ownership still stays the same and the value of the corporation still stays the same. So you, you own the same before and after. All that's changed is really the formality of more shares. So again, the main theme, the main theme you're going to see is that um, if you are a common shareholder, which we have here, right? We have 100 shares common and each shareholder owns 20 shares and you get a stock distribution or a preferred stock distribution, and your ownership stays the same before and after, and the corporation value does, does not change, no, no um, income to the shareholders to be recorded. So that's exactly what we have here. So this application you're going to see is the same as the application in problem three from the gross income problem because, again, we have only common shareholders. Each of them still owns 20% before and after. The corporation value stays the same. Boom, we have no change in net worth, right? At net worth, the first requirement of um, the Glenshaw Glass 3 um, in terms of having gross income, net worth does not go up. Therefore, this is not going to be gross income to any of the parties, and we'll see that below. So what about the situation, and that's under Section 305A. 
So what about the situations of when we do have gross income from a stock distribution? So really what you're going to see is it's when a shareholder has the potential to increase or uh, change ownership in the uh, corporation. And that's obviously going to change the value of what they own. So the first uh, potential situation where you can have income was any shareholder, any, was any shareholder offered a choice to receive cash or other property instead. So this is the two important words here are any shareholder and choice to receive cash or other property. So if, what I'm saying is that in the above example, if fruit trees like, okay, either you can get um, a 10% stock distribution or we'll pay you um, $2,000. You get the choice of either one of those. And let's say all the shareholders choose the stock. doesn't matter. Because the choice, because there was a choice to pick cash or property, it's going to be taxable and it's going to be treated as a section 301 distribution where we have to apply, uh, sorry, we have to analyze under the normal corporate uh, distribution checklist. Now we also have to look at step seven to determine the adjusted basis of those new shares of stock received if we receive stock. So if you receive shares of stock and you had the choice, it's going to be treated as a um, taxable section 301 distribution where we apply the corporate distribution checklist and we have to go to step seven to determine the basis. If no, we continue. Okay, the second question or second potential um, situation. Did a shareholder of one class of stock receive cash or other property while another class of stock received stock increasing that shareholder's proportion and interest? So the idea here, I have, some, I have an example. Okay, the example is Lemon has two classes of common stock. One is voting and one is non-voting. So Lemon has two classes of common stock, voting and non-voting, okay? And Lemon distributes cash to one class and stock to another class. Well, of course, the cash distribution would be a Section 301 distribution, just like normal under the corporate distribution checklist. Analyze that. And then the stock distribution that the other class of stock receives, that would be treated as a taxable distribution, which Section 301 distributions checklist, the corporate distribution checklist apply. And then we have to look at step seven, to determine the adjusted basis. So if we have this situation, it's a section 301 distribution and we consider the corporate distribution checklists. Okay, the third possibility. Did any uh, common shareholder receive common stock while any other common shareholder receive preferred stock? If so, it's a section 301 distribution. Again, we apply the corporate distribution checklist and we go to step seven to look at the basis. So here's an example, Lime, Incorporated has two classes of common stock, one which is voting and one which is non-voting. Lime distributes preferred stock to one class and common stock to the other class. So this is the perfect situation. So both are going to have taxable stock distributions under section 301 and we have to go to the corporate distribution checklist. If no, we continue. All right, the fourth situation was the distribution with respect to preferred stock where preferred shareholders received a stock distribution. If so, it's going to be a section 301 distribution and we skip to step seven. Again, we consider the corporate distribution checklist. So here's, an, here's two examples. In example one, Orange Corporation has two classes of stock. Class A, which is voting common stock. Class B, which is non-voting preferred stock. It distributes pro rata preferred stock distribution to the preferred shareholders. In this situation, it'd be treated as this situa it would be treated as a section 301 distribution. Have to look at the corporate distribution checklist. Apply step seven. Okay, example two, same as example one, except again, there's two classes of stock before and after the class A voting common and class B non-voting preferred. Assume that it distributes a pro rata class B preferred stock distribution to the preferred shareholders, as well as a pro rata class B um, preferred stock distribution to common shareholders. So under this situation, both shareholders would have... Um, both distributions would be subject to Section 301 distributions. The Class B preferred um, distribution to the common shareholders is taxable under Section 301. And that's because of the um, number two we saw, which one class of stock received cash or other property, while another class of stock received stock. Okay, that's that situation. And then for the preferred shareholders, they it's taxable under Section 301 because of this situation where if any preferred shareholders receive a distribution, 
it's treated as a taxable stock distribution. Okay, it's treated as a stock, taxable stock distribution. Finally, the last situation is if it's convertible preferred stock. So if any shareholder receives convertible preferred stock, it's going to be treated as a section 301 distribution. We skip to, skip to step seven to, to determine the basis. And we look at the corporate distributions checklist. So I have an example here where a, um, shareholders uh, receive new preferred convertible uh, that's convertible into common stock. So it's convertible preferred stock that can be converted into common stock. So that situation is going to be considered a section 301 distribution taxable. We apply the uh, corporate distribution checklist. All right. Number six was the distribution with respect to common stocks. So only common stock, common shareholders receive the distribution and it's a pro rata amount, a pro rata amount, which means that each shareholder receives the same percentage based on ownership. So a pro rata amount of preferred, sorry, of common or preferred stock. If yes, then it's not taxable. And this is what we saw in problem three that we looked at from the gross income problems and also what we saw in, um, in our example of fruit tree. Again, because we have common shareholders that are the ones owning stock and they receive either common or preferred shares and it's in proportion to their ownership, right? It's 10% of stock distribution. They own the same, it's pro rata because that means they're going to own the same before and after and there's going to be no change in value. So boom, it's not. It's like nothing changed. Yes, num new number of shares, but the value still stays the same. So that's exactly what we have here. So if this situation applies and it's non-taxable, then we have to calculate the basis. So I have two calculations of basis. So if it's only one class of common shares where you're getting the same before and after common, same class, then all you're going to do is you're going to take the old, the basis of the old common shares, and you're going to divide that by the new number of common shares. So in our fact pattern, that's pretty easy because I already calculated, right? The total basis of the old is 6,000, right? Remember that's the, that's the, uh, 300 per share times the 20 shares, 6,000. And then the new number of shares outstanding is 22 shares. So we're going to take $6,000 and we're going to divide that by $22 per share. And that gives us $272.73 per share. And as you see the value, I'm sorry, the amount per basis goes down. It was $300. Now it's 272 73 rounded. What if you get, what if you're receiving different classes of stock? If you're receiving different classes of stock, like let's say we had our fruit tree example and they also receive preferred stock. I'm sorry, the distribution's preferred stock and it's pro rata. Well, that, was, that would still be not taxable. That would still be not taxable, okay? But the, the amount, the way that we determine the basis is a different calculation. The way we do it is based on the proportion to fair market value. The proportion to fair market value. So let's consider an example. And this is a separate example. Let's say Strawberry owns 10 shares of common stock and Pop-Tart Inc. She has a basis of $120 total in her shares, which are currently worth $150. In a pro rata stock distribution, she receives 10 shares of preferred. So pretty much um, one for one stock distribution worth $100. So the preferred shares are worth $100. Okay, that's the value. So before the common shares are worth $150, after the preferred shares are worth 100, we don't know the value of the common, but the way we can calculate the value of the common is we know that the value of the total shares after has to be 100. We know the value of the preferred is 100. So therefore, and that's for the preferred. That's for preferred. So that means that the common must have a value of 50. So the 10 shares of common after the stock distribution must be 50. And again, the idea is because remember in a pro rata stock distribution where nothing changes in value before and after has to equal the same. So if strawberry owns stock before that's worth 150, the, the after stock value must also equal 150. So we took the 150 after we know the after preferred stock is worth 100. So the common stock must be worth $50. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the 120 basis, the $120 basis that we did before, and we're going to allocate that. We're going to do hundred over 150 for preferred because it's 150 total that's preferred. And then we're going to do the same number, 120 times 50 over 150 for common. And that's what I've done in this formula. 
So we went through, and for the common, we get 40, right? It says 120 times one-third is 40. And then for preferred, 120 times um, two-thirds, 100 over 150 is two-thirds. That's 80, and we calculate the basis. Now, if it's not taxable, I'm sorry, if it doesn't meet a pro rata distribution, again, common where it's pro rata, then it's, it is taxable as a section 301 distribution. Again, the idea is the theme is that it must be a distribution on common stock and it must be a pro rata distribution where your ownership does not change and you have the same value. So if you do have a pro rata change some way, somehow, other than the um, items one through five above, which is still possible, so that's why I put this number six in here, then it is a section 301 distribution, taxable, and we consider the corporate distribution checklist. And we also go to step seven to consider the basis of the stock. Okay. So in section in um, questions one through six in the checklist, if any of them in one through six were taxable, then as a stock district, I'm sorry, as a um, treat as a uh, a corporate distribution under section 301, then we apply number seven and we determine the basis. So if any of questions one through six are taxable, which again is treated as a section 301 distribution, 301 property um, corporate property distribution then the shareholder takes a fair market value basis in the new stock, just the new stock at the date under section 301 using those same principles. Also holding period. The holding period starts um, new. It starts anew, also known as fresh start. Fresh start, okay? Also known as fresh start. Now, one thing I want to mention is that when you receive... um, when you receive a non-taxable stock distribution like we had in Fruit Tree and also in the lemon and lime example for problem three, the holding period of the new shares gets to tack on from the old. You get that same, that same holding period in the new stock. You get to tack onto the old. You get to tack onto the old. So that is into the basis. I have that in both elements here for that basis calculation for number six when it was non-taxable. Okay, But if it's taxable in one through six, it's going to be a fresh start holding period, which means it starts new, starts new. So those are really the consequences to the shareholder. The last thing, and then we're done, consider the consequences of the corporation. So a corporation that makes a stock distribution never recognizes gain or loss, never. And the reason why is because on the balance sheet, on a stock distribution, we have assets on the left, we have, we have liabilities, and then we have stockholders equity on the right. A stock distribution all that's happening is removing stockholders' equity is broken into two parts. Paid in capital, which has the investments, like stock, common stock, and preferred stock and treasury stock, and it has retained earnings. All we're doing in a stock distribution is moving money from retained earnings because a stock distribution or stock dividend reduces retained earnings and it issues new stock into paid in capital. So um, stockholders' equity stays the same, which means net worth stays the same, so the corporation has no gain or loss. This, so no gain or loss to the corporation ever on a stock distribution. Even if it changes um, ownership to the share to the uh, common to the different shareholders, even if their ownership changes, corporation stays the same because in total still stays the same. All other consequences of the corporation depend on the treatment of the stock distribution. So, for example, if it's non-taxable, then there's not going to be any other tax effects. Okay, specifically, it does not reduce the corporation's earnings and profits. However, if it is a taxable stock distribution then remember it goes to section 301 and it goes to the corporate distribution checklist. And there, remember that earnings and profits can be affected when you look at the four-step process, when you look at the four-step process. All right, so we've just gone through the analysis and the tax considerations of the stock distributions checklist. Now, one thing I want want you to keep in mind is that there might be a potential issue when in this example... Go back to this example with Pop-Tart. Keep this in mind because you're going to see this in a later video. So keep this example in mind, the Pop-Tart example. So keep this in mind, okay? This might have potential issues for the shareholder later on. But at the date of the stock distribution, no consequences to strawberry and we calculate the basis. But what about later? Hmm. Let's just leave that as, a, as an open item and we'll come back to that in a later video because you're going to see there was some uh, answer, there was some abuse that tax, taxpayers were using in this situation to get lower tax rates. And then through that abuse, Congress closed that door by, um, by uh, 
enacting Section 306, which we'll talk about in a later video, which you definitely should look at and, and which will be another video to look at. So don't, don't skip that video. Also look at that. All right, so I hope to see you all in the next video. I hope you enjoyed this discussion. It's a real interesting issue, right? It ties back to the whole idea of gross income, but it also kind of relates to our discussion of um, the corporate tax issues that we've been, that we've been going through.